I'm so happy to see so many of you attending this lecture. Today, we will go even deeper into this subject. Maybe it would be more difficult to science the technology terms. But I would guide you through this difficult subject, and I also expect um, active discussion after my lecture. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, last lecture, I provided some overview of North Korea's nuclear status, how we can understand the correct status of North Korea's nuclear programs. And I also explained the secret of 2008. I, th I think that was the last chance that we lost to solve this nuclear talk, nuclear issues. I hope the Biden administration um, does not remain at the um, status quo because South Korea kept saying that we don't want a world, we want peaceful unification. And I think that, pro that prevented the United States from um, taking more hostile policy toward North Korea. For this second lecture, I'm going to um, go deeper in the, in the subject. I think most of them are familiar with this issue. And I think I know many of the participants today. But for those people who don't know me, I'm going to reintroduce myself because I think because I think it is very important for you to um, have confidence in my lecture to show that I have academic background in science and history. So I think I am at least um, capable of knowing the truth and force. So, so I would like to just say that you can trust what I am, what I have to say about this scientific aspect of this issue. From, because not all individuals can have a professional knowledge or research capability in this issue. So it is, it would be enough to have a few correct information. And I think I am one of the very few scholars majoring in scientific history of North Korea. I was the first doctor in this major, and there is one another person who majored in this subject, and no more people are studying this issue. Contents that I have to provide are not familiar with many of you because these issues are not widely discussed among the public. And I had difficulties in finding job in South Korea, and that's why I had to move to Germany. I think I am the only one who research only North Korean issues and teaches only North Korean issues. And so majoring in North Korea and 
teaching North Korean subject is very few right now. But the Free Institute, Free University of Berlin is very active in providing this program uh, studying North Korea. And I wrote this book as my doctoral thesis. I wrote my thesis about the uh, um, formation history of North Korea's science and technology. With my um, lecturer's position at the Free University of Berlin, I am planning to complete the full series of this book. And I also published one essay collection book <clears throat> about understanding North Korea through its science and technology. Uh, this book is no more available in the market. But if there are enough interest in this book, maybe I can republish it later. And you can see the contents of the book. And most of these contents you can find from my blog. So the reason why I uh, show this same content again and again is because it is very important to, to prepare our future together. Science, technology, and future are very common across the world, but the connection between science and technology and future is directly connected to the unification issue in the Korean Peninsula. And if you see this picture, you see that the four pillars are um, correlated, but then um, there is a gap between scientific technology and North Korea. So I think it is a bit important to, to connect to these dots. And I think that is my life mission. It doesn't give me like, enough like, money, but I think that's my life mission. Just because there are not many people who do this kind of work. And that is why I am trying to provide as many public lectures as possible so that we can tightly connect the four pillars to realize peaceful unification on the Korean Peninsula. So the contents of today's lecture is first, we will see the history of nuclear. And next, we will see how, how, how to mislead or fraud the people in the nuclear information. I understand that there are many people who are so frustrated by this um, misinformation. So I want to help those people gain correct understanding of this issue. And for missiles, uh, I will go deeper because it was not discussed the last lecture. The history of missiles is history of mechanics and, and machines. It also, uh, missile technology has also duality it can be used for civilian use and also for military use. So it depends upon us how to use this technology. You can kill people with this technology, but you can also save people with the same technology. 
uh, a North Korea publicized its technology by launching a satellite and conducting missile tests. This timeline of space vehicle missile test launching is very important because whenever there Whenever there was a new missile test conducted, there were opportunities to have a ne negotiations. I use the term uh, demonstration or presentation because that is the intention of North Korea to demonstrate how advanced its technology is. And of course, there are mechanisms and devices to deceive the public. Unfortunately, since 2015, North Korea revealed a lot of information about its missile technology to public. So because there was a a lot of information available. So it was more difficult to deceive the public. And right now, there is no more people who deny that North Korea has the capability of launching its missiles to a high range. So I'm going to discuss more about its missile technology. And in order to prevent ourselves from um, disguised, disguised with this misinformation, we have to understand the logics of, like, for example, the general paradox, illusion, and tunnel vision. There is a saying that in order to win over your fight, you have to get closer to your enemy. The closer to your enemy, you can win over. It is the same with North Korean issue. With the sanctions and with further isolation of North Korea, you become even far from solving the problems. So by closing the gap between the parties, you can prevent world crisis. And what's the reason why we cannot be close together with North Korea? Underline this misconcept is that only a few countries can have nuclear power. Now China has nuclear power and the United States has nuclear power and North Korea has nuclear power. But I think it is possible to have a friendship with North Korea even after recognizing its nuclear power. There are other scholars who agree with these allegations. Like for example, um, Dr. Hacker from the United States say that it's, it makes no sense to um, fight North Korea with nuclear just because North Korea has nuclear capability. Um, now I will see the brief history of a nuclear program in North Korea. During the Japanese colonial ruling, Japan um, hindered Korean people from learning scientific technologies. However, Strangely enough, but in physics, 
there, are, there were a lot of theoretical physics study conducted because for theory, you can study with only pencils and papers. You don't need any um, sophisticated laboratory facilities to study theoretical physics. And those people who studied theoretical physics, many of them actually um, cross border to North Korea. A representative figure is Dr. Sang Nok Do. He made a great achievement in science and his children were also scientists. So, so Dr. Do Sang Lo, he is the founding father of North Korea's nuclear program. He graduated from Gyeongsang University Physics Department, and due to the um, restrictions by the, the United States military regime, he, left, he fled to North Korea and he led the initial nuclear program development in North Korea. Later, Mr. So Sang-ho, who graduated from university in early 1960, he studied abroad in the Soviet Union. According to some stories about him, the Soviet Union wanted to keep him in the Soviet Union because he, the, the Soviet Union did not want to losing him. However, he returned to North Korea and he found North Korea after coming back from the Soviet Union because he wanted to um, live in hide. And then later, other people found out he was hiding himself um, in a country. He was again um, revealed into the, the area of North Korea's nuclear program. However, however I could not find um, any further information about his later days. And then from 1955 to 1956, there was a um, nuclear physics lab created inside the physics and math research institute at the science academy. And in 1956, there was a joint institute of nuclear technology created by the Soviet Union, North Korea was one of the founding members. With the support from this joint institute, in 1959, North Korea um, made an experimental reactor, and it also created Metatron. So the very initial prototype model of reactors were first created in 
세계 이중성이라고 하는 것은 이중 용도. Regarding duality of nuclear, it means it can be used both for civilian use and military use. No one can stop peaceful use of nuclear materials. However, for military use, international treaty can stop the use. But for peaceful use, no one can stop it. You understand why people cannot live in the Fukushima area even many years have passed since the explosion. It is because of this radioactive isotope. There are three types of radioactive isotopes. And you see this graph. The explosion or rejection of radioactive isotope follows the um, fixed interval. So that's why you can see how old this material is by reviewing the amount of its um, initial, initial time and the final status. So, this radiation can also use for peaceful uses, such as like medical treatment. It can, it can cure cancers and it can also modify um, plants and animals. Radiation can penetrate this like a microwave, can penetrate even lead which is the hardest to penetrate. And the most dangerous radiate, radioactive isotope is gamma ray. Uh, and if you are exposed to gamma ray, um, it can be destroyed very quickly. Even a robot can be destroyed in a short period of time. And you have to remember this theory that E equals MC square. It means that um, mass equals energy. There was a very um, huge discovery. So basic understanding, basic principle of this um, energy generation is that by reducing the mass, you can transform that energy into heat. And the same technology can be used for um, weapons. If you make this um, reaction very rapid, then if it reacts rapidly enough to create a massive explosion, then it can be used as a weapon. And there is another kind of um, nuclear bomb as EMP bomb, which has no radiation fallout. It's just like a microwave you use. I wonder if any of you put A, a, a coil in a microwave. And if you turn on the microwave, you will see the spark coming from this um, microwave crash. And so it means that if you turn on um, huge microwave in the air, 
then it will destroy, like it, it will um, break down, burn down all electric devices. That's the principle of EMP bomb. I think EMP bomb is one of the most useful nuclear bombs because it doesn't have a radiation fallout. So radiation materials will disperse in the atmosphere and only the energy you can use. And these days, North Korea is talking about strategical weapons. Well, there is no clear distinction between strategical weapons and tactical weapons. It, um, there is only one difference, the power of um, destruction. So when it comes to tactical weapons, it means that like, you are miniaturizing the weapons with a smaller impact, but still it is nuclear bomb. And North Korea keeps saying that it is not going to use any nuclear bombs on the Korean Peninsula because it is the land where we have to live for generations. Then where to use these nuclear bombs? When a foreign army attacks North Korea. So there are different types of nuclear bombs. For nuclear fission, it means that when you break down a material, then it reduces the mass and it creates huge energy. You have to reach critical mass in order to have this breakdown. You have to go beyond critical mass to have this explosive power. It means lower than the critical mass, you would not have this explosive reaction from nuclear materials. So that's why you make silos between the materials. That's how you can control the explosive speed. And if you go beyond this critical mass, you can have a bomb. Um, for centrifuge, you can concentrate or enrich uranium by using centrifuges. And reactors are used to create plutonium because you cannot gain plutonium naturally, but you have to burn uranium to have plutonium. So if you hear something about, about centrifuges, you can say that it's all about uranium bomb. And if you hear a reactor, then it refers to a plutonium bomb. So from this picture, you can see that there is is uranium, it shows that like a two, three, five, 92, that, that refers to the, um, the mass. So it means like a bigger number, you can see, you can say that it is heavier. And you put one neutron, it becomes two. And then later it, it breaks it down into four, so it's like geometrically increases. So if you cut down this chain, then you can reduce or stop the chain reaction. So you can use different methods to control this chain reaction. 발전소, 발전소의 so, 기본... 
에 따라 달라집니다. So the types of nuclear power plant uh, is determined by what methods you use to control neutrons. Uh, next. So I explained about centrifuges and for plutonium, you have to burn uranium. With the centrifuge, you can enrich uranium to like 20% concentration, then you can use it to generate energy. And if it is more than 90% enrichment, it can be used as a weapon. And when you put deuterium or tritium, then it can transform into helium. During the process, it creates huge, enormous energy. And in order to combine this deuterium and tritium, you have to create the plasma status, which means ultra high temperature. In order to create this ultra high temperature to um, enable this fusion, you have to use nuclear fission. So you create for energy first through nuclear fission, and with that energy, you combine or fusion deuterium and tritium. So when you hear North Korea developed a hydrogen bomb, we have to interpret the news saying that North Korea developed both nuclear fission and nuclear fusion bombs. Because in order to have a hydrogen bomb, you have to first do nuclear fission. And you have to um, have repeated reflection or repeated nuclear fusion in order to have a hydrogen bomb. I heard that in only one to two percent of nuclear materials are enough to make a hydrogen bomb because by reflecting themselves repeatedly, you can have enormous energy with this small amount of nuclear materials. That's why a hydrogen bomb is more dangerous. So this picture shows the process of fusion. So uh, I'm going to next explain what devices are used to give misinformation about North Korea's nuclear information. You hear a lot about seismic magnitude scales. It is um, determined by Richter scale. And actually the number or the scale is not important at all because once it is a nuclear bomb or a hydrogen bomb, it is just like enormous explosive power. Whether it is the liter one or liter two, liter three, it doesn't make any difference here. So even explosive power does not make the change. It's because we cannot be sure of explosive power correctly because you can assume that there was an experiment, there was a test where this test was conducted, but it is impossible to assume or estimate the explosive power because this estimation should be based on so many um, 
hypers and assumptions. It cannot be correct. And also, there are so many um, variations. They can change or affect the, the numbers depending on the nature of the land or the hardness of the land uh, which is used as a conduit to um, trans transfer the earthquake, the number can be varied so significantly, so it is impossible to correctly estimate the explosive power from these uh, numbers. What is more important is that whether it is artificial seismic impact or it is natural earthquake. And also it is important to know whether it is possible to control the whole process. So whether a country has control power in every stage of the process is very important. And we can say that North Korea is capable to control the whole process. And maybe by comparing um, different the numbers measured at different places. By comparing these measures, maybe you can um, you can designate where the test was conducted. But that's that's all we can say from these measurements. So this shows artificial seismic wave. It, natural earthquake shows kind of like smooth line, but artificial seismic wave shows this rapid changes. And by comparing these measures, we can predict where the test place was. Except that we can just disregard every other assumptions or conclusions from these numbers. Almost nobody knew whether it was a nuclear test before North Korea announced that it conducted a nuclear test. So it means that no intelligence helped the world to understand North Korea's nuclear capability. North Korea officially announced it tested six times. That's the official number. No one knows whether North Korea conducted more than six times of nuclear tests. So during the Kim Dae-jung administration, North Korea conducted a few tests to um, artificially ex make an explosion. It is doubtful whether intelligence knew about this test during that time. Anyway, North Korea has conducted its nuclear test almost every three years. So until the first nuclear test, it conducted like every three years, and then it escalated at the interval of the, its nuclear test. And then later, North Korea announced that it conducted a hydrogen bomb test. It was first revealed in 
the fact that North Korea conducted a hydrogen bomb test in January 2016, it means that North Korea already completed its nuclear fission bomb test. And maybe now North Korea has the capability of creating EMP bombs. North Korea also has the capability of subcritical experiments. It means that immediately before chain reaction, you can destroy or eliminate neutrons. Then there is no explosion taking place. So no one can know from outside whether there was a nuclear test or not. And it means that if with this capability, you don't have to conduct actual nuclear test because you can stop right before the explosion. In order to do this type of experiment, you have to have a supercomputer. And the fact that North Korea conducted this subcritical experiment means that North Korea has a supercomputer. So it shows that North Korea is capable of nuclear tests comparable to those countries of the United Nations Security Council member states. And North Korea also conducted a unitary management system. So it shows that North Korea completed as a nuclear power. And last time I explained about the secrets of 2008. At that time, North Korea announced that it had the capability of nuclear materials extracted like 39 kilograms. So that was the maximum of extraction. And North Korea also said that it used only two kilograms to make a nuclear warhead. So that was the minimum uses. And that means that um, North Korea has maximum uh, remained nuclear materials. This graph shows an estimate organized by international NGO in 1995. It was the numbers organized in 1995, and we already like 25 years passed since the report came out. So we can see that there is even more advancement in its nuclear program. And in order to have a warhead, you have to first reprocess the spent fuel. And it is reported that North Korea has 90 to 120 kilograms of plutonium extracted already, and it used only two kilograms to make one warhead. It means the number of warheads possessed by North Korea could be um, either 45 to 60 units or 90 to 120 units by how many how many plutoniums it used to make one warhead. In terms of highly enriched uranium, the maximum number of warhead it created from highly enriched uranium could be 208 units. And these numbers 
are not correctly understood or accepted by international scholars. North Korea, North Korea actually like, um, developed its nuclear power in order to protect itself, defend itself from the United States nuclear power, nuclear threat. So it is ridiculous to say that we have to be afraid of North Korea's nuclear threat and we have to equip ourselves with a nuclear threat in order to prevent North Korea's nuclear threat. It's just a vicious cycle here. More importantly, North Korea also has a laser method in enriching uranium. It takes only four days to make 20 kilograms of highly enriched uranium by using a laser method. And the methods of verification, I don't understand how we can verify because if something is lower than critical mass, no one else from outside can verify whether there is enriched uranium or not. You may heard a radiocarbon dating method because it takes fixed time to a uh, health life of a material. So you can estimate the age of a material by measuring the initial amount and the final amount of a material. But the problem is that North Korea has repeatedly conducted tests or activities in the same place over and over. So it is almost impossible to read past history here. So I understand uh, how it can be created, but I don't know um, further sophisticated methods. But, but anyway, that's that just shows that it is almost impossible to verify North Korea's nuclear capability through this kind of methods. Anyway, I'm going to um, explain now about history of mechanics and missile technology. There was an almost no legacy of Japanese empire in terms of the machines industry. And that is why North Korea put a lot of efforts in preserving its machines. If you see our wartime um, records or videos from wartime, like you can see many scenes that um, people hiding machines, like burying machines in the ground or carrying machines. It is because once machines were destroyed, there was no way to repair them. And that's why uh, North Korea uh, concentrated its efforts and time to develop its machine tools. In 1959, there was a campaign called um, Machine Tools Breeding Campaign because North Korea had fewer machine tools, it was very difficult to mass produce machines and parts. That's why North Korea tried to first create more machine tools to have um, quantitative growth in machine, machine tools. So it's just like breeding machine tools. And in 1985, 
the second motion to breeding campaign was conducted. For the first campaign, many people criticized that uh, it is so low quality, so it is it was meaningless. But through the 1985, the second campaign, North Korea achieved its qualitative growth, and it even made it impossible like enlargement automation and robotization. And it also has the capability of CNC and unmanned machine production system. And in 1995, uh, Kim Jong-il made a visit to um, CNC facility and it is named as Leonha machines. After the Soviet Union and the socialist bloc collapsed. This technology is was integrated into the missile technology because super precision machines were required to make missiles. About the origins of North Korea's missile technology, there are three theories. First, after the Cuba Missile Crisis in 1962, North Korea realized that it, cannot, it could not depend on the protection provided by the Soviet Union. So North Korea decided to independently develop its missile technology. In the wake of the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, the second theory is that North Korea received the Scud missiles as a reward of its providing support to the Middle East conflicts in the 1970s, and based on this initial input of Scud missiles, North Korea developed its own missile technologies. The third theory is that after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, scientists and engineers from the Soviet Union took refuge in North Korea and from them, North Korea learned its missile technology, but I don't have any document supporting this theory. So regarding super precision machinery, North Korea is capable of this 0.1 micro um, jet engine technology. And it also has fuel technology, which is small in size, safer and has a huge, great, a huge um, driving power. And also, North Korea is capable of creating warhead. North Korea has the capability of telecommunication engineering, like remote control of rapidly moving objects. And at the same time, a missile should make a judgment rapidly. According to the changing um, environment, and now turn to space industry, People say that like, we are entering into the world of new space era. According to the NASA information, um, North Korea is pursuing this kind of technology. And you see that the market size 
of the space industry can be like 300 trillion dollars in 2016 and cnc i'm going to further discuss this issue in my next lecture cnc can also create highly additive value industries as well as weapons development so next lecture would be focused on cnc technology so i'm going to skip that issue today and we, let's see more about timeline of space vehicles test launching in 1993 it launched a missile range of more than 1,000 kilometers. After that, in, in 1994, there was a great framework signed. So immediately after North Korea's missile launch test, the United States agreed to negotiate and sign the agreement, maybe for the fear of North Korea's missile technology. And in 1998, North Korea launched its Unhar-1 satellite. After that, the United States and North Korea signed a joint communique. During the Clinton administration, uh, all right, uh, the vice uh, defense minister of North Korea visited President Clinton at the Oval Office in 1999, and Mr. Jo Myung was wearing his, his military uniform. And in 2006, North Korea made test launch of Hepodong second. And that's when the United States gave up its CB policy and changed its policy into CC. And then in 2009, 2012, North Korea repeatedly launched its missile test, but the United States was not able to react. And that's why it was not able to stop North Korea's repeated missile test. So this graph shows that there is increasing threats, military threats, and there was no way to stop this threat. And I'm going to explain more about devices to deceive the public regarding the missile information. The first device is questioning the range. In 1998, North Korea launched a satellite, and this satellite made a few circles of the Earth. It means that it has had enough range by showing that it could circle its, its satellite over the Earth. And next question is a high angle issue. With a higher angle, it is more difficult to have safe re-entry into the atmosphere. So it is ridiculous to say that a higher angle launch is easier. It is so ridiculous. The fact that North Korea launched its missile at a higher angle means that North Korea tested its capability in the extreme condition. 
And regarding the engine power, it means that North Korea was capable of controlling the mass of the warhead, including the amount of fuel necessary to launch the missile. And in order to have a safe re-entry into the atmosphere, there should be enough technology to protect the warhead from um, destruction. It needs um, sophisticated remote, um, remote control technology and also had to maintain its inner temperature to 25 to 45 degrees. So I don't think North Korea has, has announced as the most advanced weapons. And Another misinformation about North Korea's weapons production system is that like many people say that there is the only single organization producing weapons, but it is not true. There are at least two organizations, including the military um, ministry, mili military or engineering ministry, and Defense Science Academy. So I think there are more than five agencies or organizations commissioned to develop weapons in North Korea. So I wrote a column refuting those allegations that there's only one organization producing weapons in North Korea. And after my column was revealed, um, there is like no more um, such allegations. So I think I contributed to that somewhat. And let's see some pictures. This picture shows an engine. You test this engine on the land. And this one was taken picture in 2016. So you see this warhead. You have to test whether this warhead can be safely protected after being exposed to ultra high temperature. And after launching Hasong 12, North Korea announced that it was able to communicate with the warhead after re-entry into the atmosphere. So it shows that the warhead was uh, protected from ultra high temperature. And regarding the angle of re-entry to the atmosphere, you have to um, cut down the energy, like outer energy, from penetrating into the inner space. If it is too low, the angle, then it will be bounced back to out. And if it is too high angle, then it will be break down. It will be broken down and it will be burned down. So if you integrate this re-entry technology into an ICBM, then it means you can control the target range of an ICBM. And if you see this picture, you see that like, there is like empty space between the launcher and the missile. And very small killers, like tiny killers, are supporting this launcher. And you see that there is a space between those killers. 
So it has only like eight pillars supporting this missile. And then immediately before launching the missile, the truck, the, the launcher, just leave the site. It means that with this tiny equipment, tiny device, it can resist the impact of launching a missile. It means that like, this material is ultra hard. So that like, with only four to five pillars, you can support this heavy missile. So that is surprising. And this picture shows that um, these missiles were launched with the launcher remaining on the site. It is dangerous to have the launcher remaining in the privity of the missile. It is because there should be enough support power to prevent this missile from shaking away. And then later, North Korea did not maintain this launcher in the vicinity of the missile. It means that like, North Korea was capable of maintaining the impact without the launcher. And this one is SLBM. Under the surface, there is a submarine. And this, all SLBM should be launched at a diagonal or diagonal um, angle because if it fails, then it would fall down to the submarine and destroy the submarine. That's why it usually the SLBM launch is conducted at a diagonal angle. But then North Korea conducted its SLBM test with vertical angle. That was so amazing. And, and you see these pictures showing that it has a repeated explosion to um, have the drive being power. So you see this spike, the fire, but it does not change the angle or attraction of the missile. It maintains its posture, its direction. That is amazing. From that scene, we can see that a missile can maintain its posture stable. There are only five countries who can do that, and North Korea is one of them. And this one, people said that like North Korea is preparing to preparing this missile to attack South Korea, but no, it would not use this kind of weapons against South Korea. And next, if you see the wheels, the axis, so after seven wheels, seven axis, North Korea calls it as ICBM, and no one questions the technology. And this one was revealed in 2017. The warhead looks taller than Kim Jong-un. And 
동시에 발생됩니다. The more surprising thing is that North Korea was capable of flying two missiles in parallel. So it maintained its finite, sophisticated control of four missiles at the same time simultaneously. It was so amazing, so surprising. That's why whenever North Korea does conduct any missile test, Hawaii is on a lot. And so you can see the grand pictures of the missile test. And you see the different shapes of fire generated from the engine. So the different shape shows that it has different methods of making and um, running the engine. And now you see this eight axis launcher and and North Korea also launched a missile uh, with a range of about 15,000 kilometers. And it is not possible, like not available to um, estimate or calculate the uh, relations between the axis, the number of axes and the angles and the ranges. But you see this Hwasong 16, it has 11 axes. By rollable sum, um, it is said that this can, this, this can fly uh, more than 12,000 kilometers. And you see this uh, song three, and that's the history record, history of the video archive. And you see that Kim Jong Un was thinner, so it shows that it was like a few years before. And then even then, North Korea had Pukguk Song three. And it is said that uh, North Korea has focused on four and five types. The conclusion is that combined all this information together, we can see that North Korea made success in developing its nuclear power. But then why we think North Korea failed its nuclear power? It's because of Zener's paradox. So this shows that like, when Hercules reached the point where a turtle was, during the time a turtle moved forward even a little bit, so if we, we repeat this process okay, over and over, then there is no way for Heracles to catch up the turtle. So, but the problem is that like, you can uh, divide infinitely, but the final number over the added up number of infinite intervals can be finite number because time is finite when added up. So even though it seemed that North Korea was not able to have a nuclear power like it repeatedly failed infinitely even, but still when added up this infinite intervals, infinite failures, 
North Korea was could have succeeded at the end. So the process of completion of nuclear doors it started from nothing, and there was a possibility there were activities showing that North Korea maybe had possibility for nuclear force. And then it, the, those activities stopped. And later, North Korea showed experiments and then later tests. And now it already completed its nuclear force. When you see only part of this entire graph, you don't understand it. You don't see the whole picture, but you have to see the whole picture that by repeating the process of activities doing nothing, activities doing nothing, and now North Korea is in the state of nuclear power. That's the conclusion. North Korea does not need any recognition by other countries. North Korea, in fact, is a nuclear state. It independently developed all the technologies, all the skills to control the entire process of missile and nuclear power. And as I explained before, just because North Korea has certain uh, military power, uh, can we overcome North Korea, like fight over North Korea with the same military force? In, when it comes to nuclear power, it is not possible to win over a nuclear state with nuclear weapons. So if you are too much um, concentrated only on denuclearization or the weapons, you cannot create peace. We are losing the space or opportunities to create a creative peace simply because we are too much overwhelmed by the discussion about weapons. Even with the existence of weapons, we have to increase the level of entanglement among different parties so that any act of one party can have a significant impact to other parties so that every party should be eager to prevent a war. And North Korea has nothing to lose right now without no entanglement involved in the relationship. And the United States would have the same argument. So that's why we have to increase the entanglement level between the parties so that we can prevent a war. Thank you.